Please take your seats quickly, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Tennis Weekly with Joel, Kim and Chris. On today's Tour Catch-Up, sponsored by DownloadTennis.com. Carlos Alcaraz is stunned by a Hungarian qualifier. Sabalenka gets a shock from Sofia Kenin. And Nadal's French Open participation is put in doubt. Kim, Chris, today is the 17th of May and we are here to catch up on the week in tennis at Tennis Weekly HQ. We are reaching the business end of the Rome Masters. The weather has got in the way, but we are all back at Tennis Weekly HQ to wrap up what has gone on so far. And we have had a lot of shocks, a lot of controversy and hey, Novak Djokovic or Rafael Nadal are not going to be in the final, which is the first time in a very, very, very long time. So, uh, yeah, there's going to be a lot for us to get our teeth into as usual. And excitingly, Kim, you are back from back from Eurovision, back from Liverpool and into uh, into the Tennis Weekly hot seat. I know. I've, what, what could be better than coming back <laughs> off my nice week dancing away in Liverpool, watching all the Eurovision acts, coming back to you guys to talk about tennis. You were at the, correct me if I'm wrong, you were at the what? You weren't at the main event or the main draw in my ridiculous analogy from last week, but you were in like the qualifying of the qualifying. You saw some lucky losers, did you? What, where, 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 what did you get to see? Well, sort of. Um, I did enjoy your your qualifying analogy when I listened <laughs> to your episode last week. But yeah, I wasn't at the Wimbledon final. I was I was kind of at the Roehampton qualifiers. Oh, okay. Um, Down the road. <laughs> essentially. But I did get to see everyone play. So, uh, you know, and not just those. And the Brits not do very final. well, which is yeah. a bit like this week on the tour. Exactly. There are so many parallels uh, between Eurovision and well, British tennis, maybe this, tennis This analogy, in it's now gone full circle. We're coming back to the, the tennis world. Chris is already, I see, nagging on the, on, the, on the Brits. But, I mean, it's to be fair. I mean, we are just about to record and Andy Murray has already lost to Stan Vavrinka in, what was it, in the Bordeaux Challenger? Indeed, yes. Unfortunately, yeah, not that's great. A, a pretty bad result for him. Three in love, Oof. which is um, actually not, not what our listeners predicted on social media. So <laughs> we were all wrong on that one. And um, that's a bit of a shock. But these challenges are in quite nice locations. Provence, now Bordeaux. I mean, that that sounds like, you know, summer holiday camping. Benoit Pair's dream, just <laughs> going around France, enjoying himself. Maybe throw in some vineyards while, while you're there. Yeah. And then Judy Murray didn't have to make the trip, so she must be gutted she didn't get to go to Bordeaux this week. <laughs> well, I don't know if Andy will be having some wine uh, in Bordeaux, but it was his birthday uh, a few days ago. And uh, talking of birthday and cake, Chris, you you, you sort of, um, well, you, you sent round a tweet that Andy Murray had put out the other day in reference to the cake gate that happened in Madrid. Uh, if you could just explain what, what went down on, on Twitter the other day. Well, as the Tennis Weekly Cake correspondent, um, I can give important an update role. this week. It is an important role, the one I take very seriously. <laughs> um, Andy Murray, through his um, input into the cake gate situation, where he said that he wanted um, a bigger cake, if not, if not equal, to Alcaraz, um, or he would be uh, furious. Um, which obviously he is joking. If anyone follows him on Twitter, he is very dry and very sarcastic. Um, but this did not stop this from getting a lot of attention for the wrong reasons and actually inspired a certain tournament director um, who was in the, really in the hot seat last week. Um, he still is in the Feliciano hot seat, Lopez. I feel. He still is because then he tweeted, hope I can arrange something. Um, and then after just one hour, he realised the error of his ways and deleted it. So... Clearly, Feliciano has not learnt his lesson there. Um, and I think now maybe should focus on trying to get a wild card for Queens. Was this like the, the Feliciano Lopez goodwill, positive PR and he was trying to do something nice or was he just not have thinking or I don't know, because this was just like keep digging your hole even even deeper. I think he, a bit like Kanye West, needs someone else to run his Twitter for him or to have the password and then maybe give it back to him when he's no longer <laughs> um, running the Madrid tournament. Um, I think that would make the most yeah. sense. But um, maybe Andy Murray, um, on the cake side of things, he did kind of bring this one um, back into the ring. So hopefully next week I will not be giving a cake update. 
Yeah, I think Lopez should just stay out of this now. I mean, why why make it any worse? But I mean, to be honest, if I was Andy Murray, I wouldn't have tweeted that either. I think it's maybe slightly insensitive to to joke about it, seeing as a lot of people found it, uh, you know, very upsetting. But I mean, I want to know what kind of cake it is as well. Is it coffee and walnut? Is it Victoria sponge? (laughs) You know, what, what cake are they all imagining when they're talking about it? Um, but yeah, all this talk of cake is is making me want to, you know, go out and fetch some from the supermarket. Uh, but Joel, what was your highlight of the last week? Let's let's move on from cake. Um, well, my my highlight was in real life, um, and it was at the Rome Masters, and it was between a fleeting moment between Stefanos Sissipas and Daniel Medvedev. They were caught walking past each other um, on a bridge uh, inside the venue. And uh, uh, we all know their, what should I say, fractious uh, relationship. And they just did not look at each other. They just walked past each other. Um, Daniel Medvedev, I think, gave like a fake wave over the bridge. So he almost didn't have to look at Sissipas. He was sort of making it up as he went along. And uh, yeah, it just gave a real fascinating insight, I feel, into their well, into this into this non-friendship and this rivalry that is going to be with us for time and time to come. And these guys just do not get along with each other. It was pretty awkward, wasn't it? I think um, we've all been there where there's someone that you walk past yeah. that you don't particularly want to make eye contact with. But I mean, they could have mustered a hello or a nod. But clearly... Um, it's very sour between them at mm. the moment. It's very that British, bridge, isn't it, it is, as well? Yes, it's like yes. seeing your colleagues on a train and just pretending they don't exist. And then you get off the train and then maybe you say hello to them in the office, but not not in that moment. So maybe they were in the zone. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt. They were in the <laughs> zone. They were preparing for their practice or their matches. Or maybe they didn't see each other. I mean, it's provided a perfect build up, hopefully, uh, to a match between them in Rome, which could be on the cards. Uh, they're both still in the tournament. But yeah, it feels very, very tense between them at the moment. So I want to see that bubble over on a tennis court. They'd have to acknowledge themselves to each other then, wouldn't <laughs> They'll they? They'll do the handshake playing... and look, both look the other way, won't they? There's the wave quite, to someone else. There's <laughs> been quite a lot of bizarre things going on in Rome. Um, I noticed that uh, Donna Vekic on, on Twitter put out, well, it was in a response to Holger Rune's tweet, actually, Um about when she was actually playing. Mm. She didn't know that the schedule and she went to bed not knowing, which how awful is that as a tennis player? You're trying to plan your day and you don't know, you don't know when you're playing, when, when do you get up, when do you practice? You know, that's just, that's not on. What was going on with the scheduling there? I mean, I guess you can't help the weather, but still. Yeah, I know. It wasn't great. I mean, that has plagued, I feel, Rome, Rome this week. It's made the court so slow. Also, so much moisture in the air. I feel like we've had so many three hour plus uh matches but um yeah i've i've never seen uh you know a player have to call out um you know on, on social media like help let me you know let me know by schedule but um yeah it's been a little bit of a it's been a little bit tough going for tournament directors over the last couple of masters events it feels like yeah and i saw some very odd decision making in terms of that Massetti tfo mm. match where they kind of um took them off court eventually and then they brought them back almost back onto court so I just prepare the court again and then um they didn't play so I think maybe Donna was in a similar situation with the weather where she's like maybe Holger gets some better information than she does so let's look at what's happened in Rome so far and we've had yeah a couple of surprises I think the first of which was well one of the biggest upsets of the year uh, of of some people's century upset the century I know (laughs) and that was Carlos Alcaraz losing to someone I think most of us have never heard of, um, a, a player from Hungary uh, who's outside the top 100, mm. uh, 23 years of age, Hungarian Fabian Marozhan. Um, and yeah, straight sets as well, 6-3, 7-6. I was not expecting this. Um, Alcaraz hasn't lost to someone outside the top 100 for months and months and has been racking up titles lately. So this was a big, big surprise. Joel, you're, you're nodding your head avidly as I'm speaking. <laughs> what, what did you make of this performance? Uh, well, from both players, you know, this this absolute upset. Yeah, it was a big, a big surprise. C- took me off guard. I think I think it made me put in perspective all the hype that has been around Carlos Alcaraz, particularly in the build up to the French Open. And I'd say 
you know, at Tennis Weekly HQ, arguably some of our listeners will be saying we've been guilty of it as well. And we've been bigging up him up as, you know, this big favourite, um, you know, for, for the French Open and smack this result comes along and it just puts everything in perspective to me. And um, I think Maritain on the day, he just played a fantastic match. He was playing some unbelievable drop shots. He was matching toe-to-toe uh, with Alcaraz from the back of the court. And I don't necessarily think there are any kind of mitigating factors. I don't think there were any kind of injury doubts with with Alcaraz or, or anything else. I just think Marazan on his day just played an unbelievable level and Alcaraz just didn't have any answers to it. I think he said he felt uncom- he was made to feel uncomfortable by the way Marazan was hitting um, on the court. And he just didn't have a have an answer to it. So, um, yeah, I certainly would put this in the category of of Marzan just went out there and and won it as opposed to Alcaraz losing it. And I'm all for it to be honest because I think it it now just creates even more uncertainty. I think when it comes to you know the French Open in a few weeks. And Chris, I mean, Alcaraz did say though that afterwards, uh, you know, he hasn't really had much chance to practice because he's been playing so much so do you think an element of it was just tiredness you know we've, we've saw with, with Sabalenka how tired she's been um she's been playing an awful mm. lot of tennis as well do you think actually this will do Alcaraz the world of good having lost a bit earlier to get that extra rest ahead of the French yeah and I think it's not necessarily a bad thing you know having a match that you didn't necessarily play your best in um I think sometimes that is kind of a wake-up call that you need to provide that extra motivation because he kind of was winning a lot of things and it wasn't uh coming very very hard to him he was doing it quite simply so I think it is a bit of a reality check not just for for us and tennis um uh, pundits ever I think also in terms of um for him and sense checker where his form is that never underestimate an opponent because as Joel said, like on the day, I mean, he made the Alcaraz serve that we've been talking so much about being so impressive, look pretty average in terms of um, being able to to win so many points against the first and second serve. I mean, he won 35% of points against his first serve and 55 against the second. Um, so that's something that's super impressive. And I mean, when it comes to the results we've seen, it's been 19 months since he's lost to someone outside the top 100 and he's only 20. So he doesn't lose to players who are ranked below him. So I think it is um, the reality check he needs and I'm looking forward to seeing if this gives him a renewed sense of focus when it comes to playing those early rounds in Paris. Where does this put you in relation to the French Open and Carlos Alcaraz? The fact that we were sort of bigging him up as the favourite. Is he still the favourite or where do you see this given this result? I think along with Djokovic, they're still the, the top favourites. I mean, I'm I'm basing that on the fact that I think Rafa will probably be pulling out, which we'll get on to later. Um, so I don't actually think this is going to be... Uh, I don't think it's actually going to change how I feel about Alcaraz going into the French because I do think, you know, this isn't best of five. He probably could do with a bit of a rest and it's probably better to get the loss out of the way now for him uh, going with a bit less pressure. I think you guys were talking about that a bit last week anyway. Um, but you know, this was the third round. We've had another, maybe maybe a shock. Some people would call it a shock uh, today in the quarterfinals with Novak Djokovic against Holger Rune. Chris, you're very lucky. You live and work in Denmark. This was on in your office, I think. Able to watch the tennis while you're working. Isn't that just the dream? Yeah, I mean, um, I think a few people were quite shocked because I didn't know it was on. I didn't put it on myself. <laughs> Someone else did because oh, the Danes... convenient story. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but I mean, everyone who was welcome to our office, it's right by reception. So... <laughs> Um, it just dominated mm. uh, what was happening this afternoon. But it is a bank holiday tomorrow. So I think that's why it was more acceptable to have the tennis on during the day. But I did manage to watch it. And I do think that is a great kind of observation as to whether this was an upset. Um, because I think we did uh, talk about this before. And I think in our predictions, Joel, I think this mm. is the one prediction from the, Rome. This, that potentially... this is honestly the one, the only one I feel like I can sort of smugly claim. Oh, yes, I had it. I... I was good. I was correct about that one, at least. It's definitely been a challenging <laughs> predictions for us. And normally they are pretty challenging. Mm. So, Kim, you escaped very luckily in that sense that you didn't have to put um, put a prediction in for Rome because everything that we thought didn't happen. But going into the match, we did ask on uh, Twitter what you thought as to who would be the winner. And it was only 51% that said Djokovic mm. versus 49 for Holger. So I think that's quite telling that 
on paper, you would obviously think that Djokovic, um, given his sort of record, would be the favourite. But what happened in Paris last year and the injury concerns that we have, I think um, it wasn't as big an upset as some people thought. And actually, if Holger hadn't have come through based on how poorly Djokovic was playing in that first set, I think it would actually have more question marks around him than Djokovic because Djokovic was able to really push Holger, even though he was playing subpar tennis for himself and looked like he was pretty hampered at times. So I think there are more positives actually for Djokovic coming out of this one than there are for Holger in some ways. And I I don't think like the, the conditions here at Rome this, you know, the last few weeks, they're just not the Rome conditions. I think that we use to kind of as the barometer from, Oh, they've done well in Rome. They're going to do really well in, in Roland Garros. So Again, from that perspective as well, just the the amount of rain that has been um, on on the courts in the air, it doesn't feel like uh, you know it's going to be so heavy. Yeah, exactly. It's so, so slow. It doesn't feel like it's going to offer that sort of true reflection that I feel like it has done perhaps in uh, in previous in previous years. And there was lots of. Um... Lots of moments where I think Djokovic throughout this tournament hasn't been happy with the court surface. And I think that is the nature of it being Mm. so much heavier that it is kind of clumping much more. And it does seem like it's not um, not easy to put the ball away. And especially if you've got um, a problem with your elbow, a problem with your arm, um, you don't want to put more into it to try and get the ball through the court and to finish the point. And then the longer you play, the more likely you are to kind of do some further damage there. So not not the worst result for Djokovic. He did get some wins um, and he did kind of test himself against someone who's playing some great tennis. Yeah, I mean, I know there maybe are injuries, elbows, arms, wherever. Um, but, you know, Holger Rune does now have a winning head-to-head with, with Djokovic. You know, he's beaten in the last two times they've played, with obviously that Paris final. So, you know, perhaps a little bit of a, a bogeyman or he's obviously got confidence against Djokovic. He knows he can get over the finish line, which which is good for him. Um, another thing that there was a bit of hoo-ha about was, was some of the line calls which has been happening all week, really. There was an absolutely shocking one in, in the Andy Murray match um, with Mohamed Lyani getting involved. Mm. Uh, well, he's been the common denominator, Kim. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. Is it a problem with Lyani or is it a problem with, with Rome and, and just generally how we are looking at the lines on clay? Joel, what's your opinion on that? It's a tricky one. I think, first of all, just as a fan watching it on TV, it feels odd to see the Hawkeye technology visual on the television when it's not being used um in in the stadium and it it, as much as there have been you know these announcements around the fact that technology and and hawkeye live for example is is coming in um onto the tour in in you know from from whenever like next season or the year after i can't remember but yeah i think these moments just bit a bit like get it in as quick as possible because we're still in this age of of two people arguing over a, a mark on a, on a tennis court. One person's going to be right. One person's probably going to be wrong. And yeah, this week, Mohamed Leani, unfortunately, has been on the receiving end of, of pointing at spots, saying they're in when they have been out. And, um, you know, it was interesting, I think, to see it particularly in the Rune Djokovic match because it was such a, such a key time. And I think Rune feels that the umpires don't do him justice and always are looking to paint him as the bad guy. And um, I've got to be honest, I sort of side with him in, in, on this one because the ball was in, Leone was calling it out, the, the fans were jeering. And yeah, it was doing Rune, I feel, a, a little bit of a disservice. I think something that I've, I've also seen, and I think with Mohamed Leone, is that he does like to get involved in... Um, the matches I think he likes mm. to be sort of an entertainer along with it he does like the profile of it the way that he tells the score the way that he smiles when things happen I do just think it's about getting the job done and not actually impacting the match letting the tennis happen and making the right calls and I think Djokovic actually had a go at him for the fact he was taking so long to call the score and he wanted to get on with the match and get that shot clock running and I think um, that was something that I haven't seen Djokovic speak to umpires like that for, I mean, a very long time. Do you think that was fair? I can understand why someone can get irritated by him. I do not think that you should allow yourself to be, if you know about Djokovic, who's so experienced, I think you should stay focused on it. And obviously he was irritated with his performance, which obviously was the reason why he probably did decide to say something. But I mean, if you look at Leani, like he has been suspended previously for going too far in 2018 when he came down and said to uh, to 
Nick Kyrgios, I know this isn't you. Like that's going way that's, beyond the realms that was of umpiring. Ridiculous, wasn't it? He was trying to coach it is. Nick Kyrgios on court. I remember it really that. is, and so I think that is um, a bit of an ego thing. And I think when it comes to kind of having the best voice and the best profile in um, umpiring, I think he's trying to be a bit of a Carla Nooney, and I think um, we all prefer him when it comes to a tennis match. I do worry about the the kind of the implications and maybe the influence of like Netflix and TV cameras being around and presenting tennis as more of an entertainment package and maybe people who are involved involved in it like umpires feel that they need to kind of do that entertainment element a bit more rather than kind of focusing on the fact that hang on we're in like an elite level sport setting here and I feel like I agree in the sense that with Leani that particularly with his uh, you know um his voice and 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 talking that the points out in in Italian and in English it feels a bit like he's doing this for the cameras as opposed to like milking, milking it, it. exactly like, this isn't best new drama no. this Mohammed. isn't an this exhibition is... either it felt like it's like okay that's fine an exhibition it does where feel like an exhibition you know, there's nothing writing on this but you know this is you know prize money points you know trophy at the end of the day at stake here yeah, he's got to remain professional and, and not big himself up or, mm. you know, get get too too involved. Um, I think, yeah, maybe there's a bit of the the star power. He he wants a bit of a you know, he wants to be a bit of a star on court and he you know, he is one of the more recognized umpires, but perhaps it's going a bit far. Um yeah, so dreadful calls, lots of rain, lots going on in Rome this week. Um, let's look at some of the other results because we had uh Serendolo taking out Yannick Sinner. Uh, so he's been in, in, in good form. Casper Rude has sort of rediscovered some of his form, mm. perhaps just at the right time, uh, around the corner from a French Open final that he's got to defend. And also Stefan Osipas, um looking in, in good shape as well. Uh, he'll be up against Borna Koric in the quarterfinal. Yannick Hampfen's got Medvedev and it's Rude Serendolo. And obviously Rune is already through to the semifinals. Um, where are your thoughts at for the other... Um, for the other quarterfinals that we've got lined up, you know, I I quite like Daniel Medvedev, also another player. I think like Casper like Rude, growing into um, the clay season. I think he's had quite a nice nice draw. He always get has he always has his number. I feel when he comes to playing um, playing against Zverev. And yeah, Sissipas as well. I feel like there's a few players just sort of have been growing into the season. I think we're going to see a Medvedev Sissipas semi-final which I think is going to be very very tasty but certainly with the victory that Rune has had over Djokovic I would put him as slight favorite for the tournament yeah I mean I think that's probably the case I think Joel again I'm giving you more credit for a prediction I think you did say that Medvedev would be the player that would have the surprisingly good Mm. um clay court um season so i think that that is something that's coming true and i i can see him picking up the wins because i think he's got that consistency at the moment i do wonder i mean just a question for you both uh, but just solely based on the results we're seeing in rome i think more than anything i think you know a few years ago the wta was almost kind of criticized for the unpredictability of some of the you know results particularly players at the top of the rankings you know losing to players you know further down the rankings as like this week do you feel like the ATP has gone full on WTA in that respect given some of the results we're seeing with for example with you know Rublev and Sinner losing uh, Djokovic Carlos Alcaraz is there a is I there mean, a sense of that or or is this just kind of Madrid, a one-off yeah Madrid as well Madrid is it's definitely not a one-off with you had a lucky loser in the final we had a qualifier in the semi-final in Struff and Karatsev so I think it, it. we are sort of in that sort of same WTA narrative mm. from a couple of years ago where everyone said the tour was so strong that it meant that there was so much depth and that was actually a sign of strength. But actually, I think we've done a reverse now and we've got three players at the top of the women's game who are standout in terms of being the top three. So I actually do think it's quite a good um, comparison. I think when it comes to places for quarterfinals, I think there's probably about three people for the, for the men... Um, that you'd expect to see there. And I think there are five spots up for grabs almost each tournament. So um, 
yeah, I think it is quite um, a different situation than what we've seen in terms of the same players reaching, you know, the later rounds consistently. Yeah, I think it was inevitable with the decline of the big three that this would happen. Um, and I think there's there was a stat. This is the first year now that we're not going to have either Djokovic or Nadal mm. in a Rome final, I think, since 2004 or five. Like, don't quote me on that, but it's it's been a long time. A long time, you know, some people are younger than that. Like they don't know a, a life without that. But um, obviously it's it's the first time, yeah, in almost 20 years. So times are changing. Um, and Chris, you mentioned some of those players in, in the women's side that you think pretty much top three, you know, almost, almost guaranteed somehow to get to the latter stages. One of those players, Arena Sabalenka, well, she didn't get to the latter stages in Rome. Um, she has actually been, you know, super consistent this year. She's, I think, reached the quarters at least in every tournament she's played, basically. Um, you know, has the most match wins on tour so far. But she fell um, at the first hurdle uh, to another Grand Slam champion, actually, another Australian Open champion. Who would have thought Sophia Kennan producing an upset, beating Sabalenka in straight sets? Chris, you were surprised when I think this score came in. I remember you you were uh, WhatsApping us going, what the actual? Um, did you see this one coming? <laughs> uh, I would say I did not predict this. Um, I think my message probably also gave that away as well. But I think it, it was really interesting because uh, I think Kenan has been showing signs of some of this excellent tennis. I think it was in uh, Miami. I was watching... Um, her play against actually Kalanina and when she's on and the margins are quite small with her it's very very impressive I think she moved a lot better than I thought she's been moving she's clearly been putting the work in um, on the court and off the court so I I think it was very good to see and I think it's a result that she really needed I think for Sabalenka I think it's a similar situation where you come off a great week and we saw last year that um, obviously Iga didn't play Madrid um, she left out Madrid and then came back to play Rome. And it makes me think that maybe the way that they're structured, it's almost impossible to have a fantastic Rome and a fantastic Madrid. Obviously, Iga is probably going to prove us wrong, maybe. Um, but I think we might see more players who are tempted to not necessarily play them both because it is a, it's a big ask. It's basically to do two slams back to back and then get ready for another slam. Yeah, I think the the two week tournament, I I guess because it's elongating the experience and being away and, and all of that, it it's just it's maybe it effort. does feel like it's more. Yeah, you're putting in more um, than it just being a short one week affair. So I, I think that's a good point. And I think actually, if I was a player, I would probably miss Madrid, considering the you know the altitude and all of that makes it the least comparable to Roland Garros. So I think maybe Sabalenka will learn from this with with her scheduling for next year, so she's not going to be so exhausted but I mean at least she'll have had a good rest going into to Roland Garros now after after this one and as for Kenin you know she's currently ranked 134 in the world this will be her you know her biggest this will have been her biggest win in, in a long time do, do you think you know you say you're saying that her, her form has been showing signs of improvement so do you think this would have given her you know quite a bit of confidence as she goes you know into the French Open where once upon a time she did get to the final didn't she? Clay seems to allow players who haven't necessarily had the form to get some results, whether it's more time on the ball or whether it's the nature of some players not being as strong on the surface. I think we've seen that with Sloan when she hasn't had a great season. She's put it together and got to the quarterfinals at the French. Um, we've seen that also with players like Raducanu when she was struggling a little bit. Um, and then on the clay, she got some good results last year. So I think it is a good place where you really you can grind out wins. Um, and I think it's a good place to get lots of court time. Um, and so, yeah, I, th I think it's a really positive one. And she is a problem solver on court. Um, and hopefully she can get back to doing that much more regularly because the French Open run to the final that she had, she was down sets left, right and centre. And she figured out a way to win. And hopefully she can get that sort of resilience back in that um, that savviness that she has in her tennis IQ um, can shine through once more. Yeah, and another player that's been very consistent uh, is has been Jessie Pagula, but she also went out 
uh, I think on the same day, uh, to Taylor Townsend in, in three sets. So any thoughts on that one? I mean, Joel, do you, do you think that this was a case of, of kind of, again, tiredness and just it's been a long season already? Um, do you think she just wants to, you know, stuff some Doritos at, at midnight again? <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, seeing it not just be a one, you know, one off results and seeing quite a few players, you know, in, in, the, in the top of the rankings go out early. To me, it does sort of chime back to Chris's point around the fact that, you know, these two week events, yes, these players might be getting buys into the second round, but the only other kind of experience I feel that they've got to relate to in that two week format is a Grand Slam. And that is a lot of effort and energy expended. And if you're not Igor Sviontek dishing out bagels like you are to kind of Pavla um, it can take its toll. And I think it has caught up to players like Sabalenka and I would put Pagula in the in the same category so um yeah I don't think there's anything necessarily to worry about from from their perspectives I will say as well I think you know with someone like a Sabalenka I don't think the the conditions here with the rain help those kind of power players um I think Kennan's a very good player at redirecting you know a really fast ground stroke coming at you and I think that's one of her kind of strongest attributes I think maybe it would have been a different story if it was on like a, a grass court for for example but I think that really really helped Kenin on, on the clay here so um, yeah I wouldn't necessarily be kind of you know wor- worried about it we know they're both consistent performers I'm just happy we've got Igor Sviontek, Elena Rabakina uh, lighting up I think the the quarterfinals in the in that top half yeah, they're on later. They're on after the Casper Ruud Serendolo match. So I'll definitely be tuning in to, to this one because Shvontek Rabakina, you know, Rabakina's beaten Shvontek the last mm, two times they've played. Tasty. That both came on hard court. So this is very much, you know, obviously a clay court where Shvontek is, I would say, definitely the favourite. Um, you know, Rabakina, we don't know so much about her on a clay court so far. She hasn't proven herself in the way that Shvontek has on the clay. But the fact that she's won both of her matches against Shvontek without dropping a set so far this year, you know, that's got to count for something. So, Chris, who are you predicting for, for this evening's match? And obviously, by the time this podcast goes out, it, <laughs> it's probably been and, been and happened. But um, let, let's get your thoughts anyway, Chris. Where, where are you thinking? Well, I think... I'm going to slightly contradict what Joel has said in terms of the nature of the court. I think because it is so slow and it does set up, it does give some of those players that might not be the quickest movers a bit more time on the ball to really strike the ball. So I actually think that part of the reason for Rebecca's success um, this time round um, on the clay is linked with that, that it does give her the extra time. And I also think something that Medvedev said that was quite interesting was that he was surprised when he played against a Spaniard early on the week that they weren't playing in what he called the Spanish style of cross-court, cross-court, cross-court. They were going more down the line. And I think Rabakina is kind of uh, prone to being a cross-court player. That's kind of what she's kind of um, famous for in terms of where she directs. So I kind of feel like if she's willing to take it on, which I think she will have to be, I think this could be really entertaining. And I I do think she's going to have chances. Um, I don't think it's going to be like a straight set uh, eager win. I think there might be a, a very close set. Um, and then there might be like a sort of a, a less close one, but hopefully it will go three. But I am going to say eager because I mean, you can't really not. And if there is a time when eager is going to beat Rebecca into this year, I mean, it, it, it better has to be, be now. Yeah, in Rome right now. I, I mean, think. she didn't. I don't think she played particularly great against Donna Vekic, but even even playing at sixty percent, she still kind of came out of a six three, six four victory. So uh, if there are gears to go up there, uh, I think it's got to be in Iga Sviontek's hands. I mean, Iga Sviontek has won twenty four consecutive sets at this tournament and fourteen straight matches. Mm, and I predicted so. she's going to lose a set, so Ooh. that's that's already pushing it. I'm right? just disappointed we're not getting the 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 Sviontek Sabalenka trilogy trilogy fight. Yes, because then it's been one each, hasn't it, so far? So it <laughs> they're, would have they're saving been it for Roland Garros. French final, the yeah, French exactly. final, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, Rebecca has beaten uh, Schwantek on the clay at a junior tournament in Milan in 2017. So that went three sets. Mm. We'll, we'll have to wait and see. The other quarterfinal in their section has happened already today. Ostapenko beating uh, Paola Badosa, who was on a, a good run here. Um 
so the winner of Svantec Rebecca will be playing Yelena Ostapenko, who has been in in decent yes. form um this week. A few bagel sets she's uh got as well en route to the semis. And she's had a few arguments as well with uh with umpires over over line calls. Um to be expected, <laughs> I have to say with Ostapenko. That's not a surprise. <laughs> yeah. I can't remember I I can't remember the the lady the lady's name, but it's the really stern female umpire she she check i think or, or, or something like that and uh they they should just have a sitcom together the, their dialogue with each other is was borderline i think hilarious um during uh during their match i think it was ostapenko kasakina but don't quote me on that but um yeah i think ostapenko has looked very very good i still don't feel like you can look at the form book with ostapenko and you've got to take it one tournament at a time but we know that she's one a, match, at one a match at a time one set at a time chris um but you know she's a french open champion and i i genuinely think with this run she has put together in rome 20th seed here i think she is going to be one of those danger players to look out for when it comes to Paris. She's up to 10 in the race as well. Mm. If you look at the players that she's beaten here, I mean, Cristea just come off a challenger title. Um, that was the first round. Krajikova, she managed to bagel in that second set. She also bageled Kasakina in the third set. And now she's taken out Paola Badosa. So you have to say this is reminiscent of that French yeah. run in terms yeah. of some of the form that we're seeing and really backing herself in these um, tricky moments. So whoever does win out of Iga and Rabakina, I do think um, it's not going to be a walk in the park in that semi-final. No, and the, on the other side, we've already got the semi-final lineup uh, between Kalanina and Kudometova. Uh, Kalanina really battling to get there. Uh, she won the longest match of the year so far on the WTA Tour. Three hours and 43 minutes. And, and Sara Sarivas Torme was not involved, <laughs> uh, which is the no. biggest shock Kim, of all. This match could have gone four hours. Off, up to the first couple of sets, I think they were at two like two hours 30 plus and uh yeah they both of them put their absolute heart and soul into that match it was um, it was incredibly physical i think had admire was in in tears afterwards given the amount of effort she had put in to to come up short but um yeah kalanina seems to be doing the business at the moment she obviously had that win over kenin um and then keys and um you know had admire i thought was on a on a, on a good run here i was actually putting her as the, the favorite but um Kalanina's done well to come through. Do you think the winner of the tournament is going to come from the, you know, Shivontek slash Rabakina slash Ostapenko section? You'd have to say that, I think. But I do think Kalanina, in fairness to her, I do think that um, she is a great ball striker. I love watching her play when she's playing well because she does swing off both wings. I think she just kind of sometimes makes those errors. Um, and I'm really hoping it's not Kudometova um, versus Sriontek because they have never had a contest and we might be looking at another double bagel in the final of Rome. Mm, yes, of course, because Sriontek famously double bageled Pliskova in the final here, I, I believe it was. Or was that maybe it's written. Maybe it's two, years ago. two years ago. Yeah, yeah maybe. Well, oh, the, the bakery may be opening <laughs> once more. Another branch. Yeah. <laughs> Let's have a very quick break now, but do join us in the second half where we'll be discussing Emma Raducanu's uh, split from US Open winning coach Andrew Richardson. There's been a, an article come out about that, which is why we're talking about that again. Uh, we'll be looking at one-time major winners on the tour and also looking ahead to the rest of the action still to come in Rome. So do not go anywhere. Welcome back to Tennis Weekly, sponsored by DownloadTennis.com. And now we're going to move on to a bit of par for the courts. Uh, I think, Joel, you've got one for me and Chris. I'm back to to try and challenge for another title. Are you refreshed? Are you feeling confident, Kim? If it's about Eurovision, yes. Uh, my tennis knowledge might have slid in the last few weeks. I, you know, I did... I did say to you before, uh, well, I said to both of you actually before we, we were recording, I do really want to do a Eurovision par for the courts for both of you as a little bonus. Oh, there's got um, to be something in tournaments. Medvedev's won countries, he's won <laughs> in Europe and the Eurovision link. Yes, Winners place, of Eurovision the final. and places that Djokovic has won a title. Yeah, I, I don't yeah there's got to be some connection, connection Joel. You yeah. can think, you've got a year to think about yeah. it. We, uh, oh yeah, I'll, I'll have a th I'll have a think of that. I mean, might, might include the, as that as some bonus content maybe in the future. But I do have a tennis 
WTA tennis uh, related par for the courts for both of you. Excellent. Now, this, I think, has a lot of potential red herrings. So I'm hoping Chris might fall into. I, I think this is definitely a 50-50. Love the support, Joel. Yeah, I know. No favoritism on, at all. Sorry, yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not biased here. I'm not biased here. Um, right. My topic for you both this week in our par for the courts back and forth is top 20 career prize money leaders as of the 8th of may 2023 in history for women in history yeah oh gosh okay goodness gracious me so top 20 there's a lot of obviously big names in here um there's a lot of there's a few current names as well actually on the court on the on court, the court. With... so yeah careers oh, career, prize money not sponsorship okay. not sponsorship just from tournaments collecting the paychecks racking them up I've got the top 20 in that list. Okay, right. Right, let's let's get on it and do it. Um Who wants to who wants to start? Toss a coin. Yeah, okay, I'm going <laughs> to toss a coin. Chris, heads or tails? I'm going to go for heads. I better go tails then. <laughs> okay, right. I'm doing this off screen very quickly. It's tails. Oh, hurrah. Of course it is. I'm <laughs> winning already. Okay, so I'll go first. Thanks, Joel. Um, I'm going to go for Serena Williams. <laughs> Correct. Yes. Number one on the list. I mean, that was what we were tossing a coin for, <laughs> to say Serena Williams. The one that we know. Um, I mean, it's got to be Venus Williams. It's got to be up there. Correct. Yes. Number two on the list. Really? Mm. Naomi Osaka. Correct. She is 20 on the list, Kim. (gasps) Skin of your teeth. (laughs) Okay. That has really scared me that she's number 20. Because she's she's won slams when they paid Mm. you to win slams. Exactly right. That's what I was thinking. I know a lot of her money is sponsorship, but wow. Okay. Um, I'm going to go for Kim Clijsters because she won a lot of those bonus US Open series, US Open tournaments. Correct answer. Yes, she is number 14 on the list. Uh, Maria Sharapova? Correct. Fourth on the list. Um, Simona Halep? Correct answer. Number three on the list. Oh, really? Okay. Mm, Complete the top five, Kim. (laughs) Have we got four of them? Yeah, uh, we've got the top four. I'm just trying to think now because... Of... Who's been around a bit? That's oh, what I'm thinking, Kim. Yeah, because Osaka hasn't played for as long, has she? Even though she's won, what, four Part-time slams? Part-time player, according to Joel. Caroline Wozniacki. Correct, yes. Number seven on the list. I think, given the longevity of Petra Kvitova's career, that she will be somewhere in the top ten. Correct. Yes, that completes the top five because she is number five on the list. Well done, Kim. We've done it. Woo. Is that game over? <laughs> we can both win. Uh, I don't know how far back to go because there's some really big players. But as as you said earlier, Chris, the money was just horrendous then. So I'm reluctant. Um, oh, gosh, who's had a really long career? Oh, maybe this player, Angelique Kerber. Angelique Kerber. Is a correct answer. Yes. Number eight on the list. I'm going to say a, pl- a player like Azarenka will also feature because she's been around a while as well. She did have a break, though, for a while, didn't she? She did have a break. But it's a correct answer. Phew. <laughs> number, s- with number six on the list. Oh, OK. Karolina Pliskova. Correct answer. Eleven on the list. I am going to go for a, a player who, if she isn't on the list, if she's wrong, I don't want to be right. I'm going to go for Steffi Graf. Oh, Chris. Steffi Graf. Tournaments then. How much did they pay? It's a correct answer. Oh, it's a correct thank answer. Goodness. 17th thank, on the ooh. list. Thank goodness. Because what, what didn't she win? Yeah, that is true. 
Oh, now I don't know whether to go down a more recent player route. <laughs> Is this adjusted oh. for inflation? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to go rogue and just say this person, but I don't... I don't... Svetlana Kuznetsova? That is a good guess. And it's a correct answer. Oh, number yes. 10. Oh, well done, Kim. Number 10 on the list. There is one more player in that top 10 you've not named. Oh, this is really <laughs> difficult, isn't it? This is the it? longest one we've done, I, know, I think. I know. <laughs> I'm going to have fun editing tonight, yes. It's going to be an extended <laughs> podcast. But um, I think that despite playing for a short period of time, if... Osaka is on the list. I do think that Ash Barty will be on the list. There or thereabouts. It's risky, but I'm going to go for it. Ash Barty is on the list. Oh. Number 15. Oh, okay. <sighs> That's cool. Must be very close between 15 and 20 then. You are not wrong on that. I'm now... I want to... <sighs> no, this person hasn't won slams can't say her surely although Neither did has, i know yeah. oh okay i'll just go rogue again because i'm just thinking who's won wta finals that pays quite a lot doesn't it if it's in china so alina switzerlina it's a correct answer oh! 19 on the list <laughs> that is a great guess i would never have ever gone for that um, i'm also surprised she's won more than asaka prize money I mean, she plays. She did play a lot of tournaments when she was playing. Mm. Um, she's obviously back now. Um, right. You know what? Joel's favourite, Muguruza. She's won slams. That's a great shout, yeah. It's a correct answer, oh. yes. 12th <sighs> on the list. Surely we've got 20. I want to say this Caroline going, Garcia. There's a few now. names. There's been going on for 20 names. minutes. <laughs> Oh, um, okay. I'm going to go back to my original. Actually, how many slams did this person win? Justine Ennin. That's a good guess. <clears throat> Justine Ennin is an incorrect answer, Kim. Oh, dear. 21st on the list. So oh. just outside the top 20, which means, Chris, you have a chance to take part for the courts this week? I am going to focus on players that are playing more, oh, about to say more recently, but I've got a name. I'm going to go for Sam Stoza because she played for so long and kept on, there's got to be some money in the mixed double slam she was winning. Joe will love this. Sam Stoza <laughs> is also an incorrect answer. Oh, oh. No. She is 22nd on the oh, list. Oh, you're Oh, no. <laughs> we go back. We go back to we Kim. Continue. We continue. We continue. A lifeline. Yeah. A lifeline, a lifeline has been thrown to you, Kim. Make the most I of it. <laughs> I like these new rules. Um, I am going to go for someone really big and famous who I think, just because she played for an extraordinary long amount of time, uh, Martina Navratilova. That is a correct answer. Yes. Ooh. <laughs> Number 18 on the list. Oh, this is horrible. Chris, okay. just no um, pressure, but I think there are three answers left that you could give. Okay, so I'm also going to follow the WTA finals route and longevity of career and consistency at the top. And I'm going to go for Agnieszka Rorwanska. That is a correct answer. Number oh. nine. Two, Number two nine left. on the list. This is wild. We never do this well. Given that Radvanskas are correct, I've, I've now got a new person that I'm going to uh, mention, except I'm not very sure about this, but um, Yelena Yankovic. Oh, that's a good one. That is a very good one. <clears throat> but it's an incorrect oh, one. No. She's number 23 on the <laughs> list. So so now for the win. So, Chris, there are two remaining correct answers in our longest ever par for the courts, if our listeners are still with us. Yeah, thank you for uh, persevering. <laughs> we promise we're not like Googling anything. We're just 
like managing to it's, drag keep this, this one going. out. <laughs> it's because the stakes are so high. Um, I've got I've got one name. Um, I'm going to say I'm, I'm not sure if you've said her, so I might get this wrong anyway. Martina Hingis. Oh, I was thinking about saying her earlier. Martina Hingis is a correct answer. Chris, oh, well you done. win. Oh, you win. That was half of the course. I'm glad it's come to an week. end. Thank goodness. Well done, it's, Chris. Can surely we have to just test Joel next week, Kim? Something really mysterious <laughs> player. Something really <laughs> yeah. awful and long for Joel. Yeah. There was one name, one name you did not get. I'm surprised you got 19 between you. I mean, absolute fair play. One other name? Any ideas? Billie Jean King? No. No. Uh, what Sellers? about Sloane? Sloane Stevens? No. no. Um, Nadia Petrova? Lindsay Davenport. Oh, Lindsay, Lindsay Davenport oh, was, was yeah. number 16 oh. on the list, but all the others were wow. correct answers. So the highest slamless was Brad Vanska. Vanska. Yeah. yeah. Good on her. Mm. Oh, I, can, I, I, I need like a break I now. Breathe. I need, I need to, a cup of tea. To, yeah, I'm exhausted. It did. It did help you telling us where they ranked when we knew Osaka was at twenty. We had to rethink our <laughs> yeah, strategies. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I know. I could have been wrong, you know, from from quite early on if she hadn't have been. But uh, let's look at what's in the mailbag to perk us up again after that uh, very thought provoking path of the courts. Uh, we've had a question from Ben on email, who has asked us. Among current players on either tour, which one-time major winners are most likely to win a second major? And also, to play devil's advocate, which one-time major winners are definitely not winning another slam? So we've got to name one person for each. So let's do who's going to win a second major. Joel, who are you going for? Uh, Ostapenko on clay. I think it's. I think if if it's not Igor Swiatek, I think Ostapenko is going to be there or thereabouts. Okay, Chris. I am going to do the thing that I always do, and I'm going to say Radicanu. <laughs> she may <laughs> have had three three surgeries, but that girl has something special. Um, and I have to say, her and Carlos would be my answer. Chris is still a believer. Um, I would also say Carlos Alcaraz definitely. And I think I think Sabalenka or Rabakina will will or both will will win one. Which uh, slam? Which slam? Uh, Carlos will win the French Open at, at some point. Sabalenka will win the U.S. Open. Uh, I think, but I mean, I don't know if Ben wanted me to say three. I've said three. He might have just wanted one. So let's have a look at who's not going to be winning another slam at all i'm gonna suggest someone like krichikova i think she'll win more double slams but singles i don't know if she will okay okay you may not um, like that chris i'm not a huge fan of that one um i went for um the men's side for this and i went for dominic team because there are no signs unfortunately there mm. that that's looking likely and i also think that maybe chilich might be a little bit past it now personally <laughs> i yeah i mean without wanting to be sound yeah rude but i think past it might be for slam winning purposes correct yeah no offense chilich and and no offense to chris actually because i'm going Sloan Stevens. Oh, we're just no. having a go at Chris's Joel. favorites. Joel, what? What is happening? This is just all of my favorites coming up. Um, did, did you not know that Sloan just won a WTA one two five? That's yeah. basically well, I a know, slam. right? Exactly. She's going to be one she of the favorites. She won the slam of the I yeah, ITF Open. events. Yeah. No. Um. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm. There's. I've not seen enough yet. Maybe for same re similar reasons. You for Dominic Team. Me for Sloan Stevens. Mm, it's been a that while as well, hasn't it? Mm, for, she'll well, prove sorry, you wrong. Sorry, Sloan. Sorry, so fads. But thanks, Ben. 2023 French <laughs> Open champion. <laughs> thanks, Ben, for that uh, question. Uh, definitely good to to think about uh, who we would we would go for. So, uh, listeners, let us know your suggestions. Who do you think is and isn't going to out of our one-time major winners so far? Um, but let's have a look at what's been in the news this week because um, we have had... Uh, a news article come out uh, which features Andrew Richardson, who is a very, well, very famous, perhaps in tennis circles, British tennis circles. He is the coach that Emma Raducanu had, who coached her to her US Open triumph back in 2021. He's come out uh, with a bit of an interview to say that he was essentially just dropped by uh, Emma, Emma's team after the 
the US Open that they were doing a nine week trial, which is what we all kind of uh, understood. It was supposed to stop, um, you know, after after the US Open, but they were sort of he was hoping to renegotiate the contract. He wanted to carry on working with her. But about two weeks after the US Open, there, there was no contract and her agent just sort of said that they were not going to pursue it. And that was it. Um what did you both make of this of this news? Because I, I don't think he's really come out and spoken about this before. And it's really interesting because I think the understanding amongst tennis circles was that it was more like his decision to step away. But actually, based on what he's saying, it's very much it was Emma's team that decided not to pursue it. Um, in hindsight, is this a was this a terrible move? Do you think things would have been different if she stayed with him as her coach? I think I think this is very interesting i think it's a shame it's come out at a time when emma's in a, on a hospital bed having had uh, three operations because i'm not sure this is the sort of attention that is is particularly pleasant at this time um but i think in terms of what he said i mean it's completely the opposite as you said of what was put out in the media from a very very um comprehensive um media story and media coverage was that it was due to the fact that he had wanted to to prioritize his family didn't want to travel on the tour and that's obviously at complete odds to this so the thing that makes it so concerning for me hearing this is that it shows that from the off Emma's team did not make good decisions and they were not making the right decisions for her and that she wasn't part of that decision making process because she clearly had a great connection with him They clearly had something really special and they did do something really special that had never been done before. And then he was binned off after two weeks by the agent. And it just screams her potential as a athlete, as a um, a star was just where all of the the vultures were coming in and they all wanted to try and, you know, find a better way than what was already something that was working, try and get a bit more cut for themselves. So I think this speaks true to our comments last week in terms of the way that she's not being managed properly. And, Emma, if that's still your agent, fire your agent because there are lots of people who do have your best interest in heart that I'm sure are more connected to British tennis. Um, and I, w- I would give Andrew Richardson a call because he's been very classy in this interview, but again, all very concerning. And um, that was the start of the problems. So I really do believe that. Yeah, I think um, I think it would be great if maybe the, the, the team did reach out to him, whether it's going to work after all of this has happened. And I think if they were to work together again, there would be a lot of eyes and expectations, which it, it may not work again. You know, it might have just been that one magical summer. So, you know, that remains to be seen. But I mean, just going back to Emma, we wish her well with her recovery. I know she's had more surgery since uh, you guys spoke about it. So, um, yeah, we wish her well with what's, with what's going on at the moment. Um, the other thing that's come out in the news very, very recently, actually, um, there's a press conference that Rafa is holding tomorrow at his academy in uh, Manacor to talk about uh, Roland Garros, if he's going to play or not. So I think it's at four o'clock tomorrow. Not good. Um, we haven't heard good signs. I think his agent came out saying that, you know, Rafa was in a bit of a, a race against time, uh, as the headline sort of has quoted. He's turned down a wild card offer to play at the, um, well, he turned down a, a wild card to play in Bordeaux um, this week. So, we're not. Ex- I'm not expecting. I love uh, the cheek of that, by the way. Good the, news. I love the cheek of the the Bordeaux tournament offering <laughs> offering Nadal a wild card. Um, no, but um, yeah, it, it doesn't doesn't sound particularly promising, and it just builds, I think, into the you know the uncertainty around you know Roland Garros and the fact that um, you know sadly it doesn't look like you know Rafa is going to be there. I know there was a video as well circulating earlier this week of him training and him what it looks like kind of breaking down after um, after a point. So um, yeah, it's 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 just really sad because you 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 think about Rafa at Roland Garros as almost part of the furniture. Um, you know, given his obviously his his prowess there, and it's sad that it might end. Unfortunately, like like this, um, we you know we don't know that, but um, it's sad for everyone. Yeah, I don't. I think it's, you know, it's not just I feel <laughs> Rafa fans hurting. It's I think every, all of tennis would love to see him there. Yeah, one player that won't be there is Nick Kyrgios. He's already announced he's not playing due to a knee injury, uh, which I I kind of get the impression Nick Kyrgios isn't that bothered, but his girlfriend might be because apparently uh, she was very. Uh, adamant that he should play because she's never been to Paris. Um, so 
that's for another that's for another time but um let's uh have a look at uh, the rest of the action in Rome uh because we have obviously the Rebecca and Shvontek match later on today tomorrow we've got all of the other um quarterfinals for the men happening so Hampman and Medvedev and Sitspas and Korich but who who's winning the tournament at the end of the week uh, a woman and a man from each of you who are your winners Chris I I don't know what I've said on this podcast but I'm gonna say Ostapenko I'm not sure <laughs> if that lines up at all um probably doesn't so please correct me if I'm wrong and then on the I'm it's all about Holger I'm I'm going for um two of my faves nice I'm sticking with my predictions from last week I might not have got the semi-finals right but I'm getting the champions right and I'm sticking with uh Runa and Sh- and Sviantec Oh, I'm going to go Sviantec and Sitsapas. There we go. Ooh, I feel okay. like rude. All might... to play for. Yeah, I know. We'll, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, but yeah, we will be back next week to discuss the final few days in Rome. And let's hope bet for better weather. I mean, the, the San Marino Imola Grand Prix has been cancelled mm. due to all the rain and flooding. So at least we've had some tennis. Yeah, it's not been. Uh, yeah, it's not been great. I feel like yeah, it's almost like we had like waterlogged, waterlogged courts at so, at some points. But um, yeah, let's hope for better weather as we reach finals weekend, listeners. I hope you've enjoyed our latest episode of the Tennis Weekly podcast. Remember to subscribe to us to stay up to date on all the action to come from the ATP and WTA tours. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and all major podcasting platforms out there. And if you like what you're hearing, then make sure to leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. You can also follow us on social media or email the show. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Tennis Weekly Pod. Or you can email us on tennisweeklypod at gmail.com. And do check out our website as well, tennisweekly.co.uk. And we will be back next Monday at Tennis Weekly HQ for another tour catch up, looking back on all the finals action from Rome. So I hope you can join us for that. But in the meantime, it's goodbye from Kim. Goodbye. It's goodbye from Chris. Goodbye. And it's goodbye from me. We'll see you again soon.